So what we're going to talk about today is NASA's NEMO mission. The NASA Extreme Environments Mission Operation is a high fidelity spaceflight analog and today we're going to talk about the very particular medical research and then some of the applications and then the objectives of the most recent NEMO 21 mission that happened this summer. And we'll talk a little bit about kind of the background of the mission itself, the Aquarius undersea habitat. What is NEMO? Why is NEMO important? How is the research that is done on NEMO applicable not only to the space program but to conventional medicine? And what are some of the particular concerns that we deal with when we're looking at medicine on the edge? So the Aquarius Undersea Laboratory is the world's only underwater research laboratory based off the coast of Key Largo down in Florida. The hatch depth is at about 45 feet and then the bottom depth of the habitat is at 62 feet. It is about 200 square feet um, of an interior platform which is about 18 and a half square meters and then it's connected to the surface by a life support buoy. That buoy provides communication with topside with the shoreline and also provides some of the other life support components necessary for actually supporting the habitat. The habitat itself, as you can see here, is based off a sleeping area where you have six bunks, then you have a small living working area where there's a galley, on one side you'll have table, sink, and the other side you'll have the components for life support of the habitat itself. Then you have a scientific module where we can do some of the science experiments, where we have consoles for monitoring, and then we have a wet porch. The habitat itself can actually be used as its own recompression chamber, which is necessary when we actually recompress the aquanauts to bring them back up to surface depth post-mission. So looking at the habitat, we can actually see that here in the top left-hand corner, you have the wet porch. The inside of the habitat is actually pressurized to the same depth as the water outside. So you effectively have a moon pool where you can get in and out of the water effectively at any one time without having to go through any kind of an airlock. This is where we get in, we get out, and we can go and conduct EVAs, extravehicular activities, where we actually walk on the bottom of the seafloor. You can see here down the bottom left hand corner, you can see the small table where we eat, where we work, and so on. In the top middle, you have a view into the bunk room and then the small fridge, some of the living environment uh, within the habitat itself. Then the scientific module where we have laid out of consoles, some of the screens where a lot of the scientific equipment is kept. And then the ability in the top right hand corner to see actually inside the habitat through the viewport with aquanauts on the outside and then crew members on the inside of the habitat. So what is NEMO? NEMO is a high fidelity spaceflight analog. NASA uses this undersea research laboratory a couple of times a year to put astronauts down underwater to live and work up to two weeks. And it is developed specifically for astronaut training, developing new tools, techniques, technologies for future spaceflight application and future long duration missions, possibly going back to the moon, going to an asteroid, going to Mars and so on. It is specifically used for astronaut training in that it provides a leadership context within a high stress operational environment for astronauts that either have already flown, that would be future commanders, or new astronauts that need that type of operational experience, especially getting ready for a long duration mission. It also teaches team dynamics and really reinforces the psychosocial aspect of living and working in this small, self-contained, almost underwater research station down on the sea floor. It allows us to develop new spaceflight techniques, new hardware specifically for next generation tools for exobiology, retrieving samples from another planet. How do we collect those samples? How do we ensure the fidelity of those samples? How do we make sure that either the samples, the crew member, the vehicle, or our own planet is not contaminated by collecting these samples and ensuring that we have the tools and techniques ready. Another component is actually operating under time delay. When we go beyond the moon, possibly to an asteroid or onto Mars, there will be anything from a couple of second delay up to possibly a 30 minute delay. Operating under those types of conditions, either during contingencies, conducting mission critical tasks, scientific experiments and so on, 
it is absolutely imperative that we understand the nuances of being able to work within a time delay and actually being able to make those critical decisions while interacting with a ground team that is not receiving communication in real time. Another valuable component of actually working in this type of environment is medical research. Looking at telemedicine, the application of telemedicine, a future application of biomedical technology, genetics, epigenetics, telomere research are just some of the components that we've looked at, that we've researched, and that not only provide particular application to the space program, to astronauts, but also have pretty significant implications for domestic and conventional medicine as well. So this was the NEMO 21 crew. It was made up of six crew members. Uh, we actually split the crew halfway through the mission, which was the first time that this had occurred. Um, you had three astronauts um, and then three pretty high-level researchers from different research organizations. Um, you had on the research side, you had a representative from the Naval Postgraduate School who ran the Autonomous Underwater Vehicle Lab. You had a researcher from an organization called IHMC or the Institute for Human and Machine Cognition who has just been inducted into the International Women Divers Hall of Fame. Then on the bottom right hand corner, you have in the middle Chris Cassidy who is head of the Astronaut Corps. You have Reed Wiseman and Megan Banken, who are the two commanders for this mission. Reed Wiseman actually flew on the International Space Station on Expedition 41 for six months in 2014. Megan Banken was actually the astronaut that retrieved the Hubble Space Telescope on the Space Shuttle mission that actually went and did its repair a number of years ago. Then in the bottom left hand corner you can see the two gentlemen in the orange t-shirts. They are the habitat technicians. One of those divers was actually the former master Navy diver for the entire US Navy, the highest ranking diver in the entire Navy. They oversee, run the habitat, look after the aquanauts and ensure all the systems are running optimally at any one time. So what type of training went into this mission? Why was this important? Well along with the weeks and months of IRBs, paperwork, protocols and experiment preparation, we spent a week long training session at Johnson Space Center with the astronauts. Uh, we got to swim or do our swim test in the MBL, the neutral buoyancy lab. The MBL is the big pool, one of the biggest swimming pools actually in the world where we have a full mock-up of the International Space Station actually sunken in the water for the astronauts to do EVA or uh, spacewalk training. Then transition a couple of months later to Key Largo, we actually had a week's worth of training before the mission where we looked at the experiments, we looked at the protocols, we got trained on the diving apparatus that was used during the mission. As you can see here on the right hand side, the helmet that we used was a Kirby Morgan stainless steel. That full face helmet is actually a 40 pound helmet that is worn that gives us full voice communication so we can actually hear and talk to not only the habitat but back to topside as well and then training on some of the underwater navigation equipment as well at the same time. So the mission is effectively broken up into interior objectives and exterior objectives. The bottom left hand corner you can see Megan actually working on what we did during this mission was the first DNA sequencing underwater. This was actually to trial and test a lot of the procedures that would be used by Kate Rubens who is actually currently on the International Space Station who actually went and did the first DNA sequencing in space. This will be used in future to go and sequence microbes, possibly um, human components of sequencing later on on next generation missions and we use a new set of technology of a mini PCR and a mini ion DNA sequencer during this mission which was a very intricate process and that was one of the core fundamental interior objectives. In the top left hand corner you can see Reed Wiseman wearing the Microsoft HoloLens 3D goggles and he's actually sitting at the EVA console. When we have aquanauts on the sea floor doing effectively a modified spacewalk for six, seven hours, at any one time you have somebody on the interior of the habitat providing them with data and communications, feedback and support. And all of those screens that you can see are providing a level of data of their position, some physiological monitoring, and modified data on their suits. And one of the biggest components of this 
was looking at the amount of data that an individual crew member could actually handle during a mission set like this if it was to take place on another planetary surface. And this was one of the key components of putting a non-astronaut crew member into this type of environment. In Johnson Space Center, um, at any one time when astronauts are doing spacewalks, you have astronauts that are seasoned, sitting on console, supporting the astronauts that are doing an EVA or a spacewalk. One of the things they must learn to do is to assimilate this data and be able to support those crew members and make these critical decisions. The question becomes, if this mission was to happen, and we say, in the surface of Mars, with that type of communications delay, you would no longer have the real-time communication from mission control. So one of the questions became just how much data could you actually go and assimilate, process at any one time. From my point of view, this became one of the biggest learning curves from the mission, because had there been one more screen of data on that console, I felt that I would have been completely overloaded. Um, some of the other experiments that you can actually see here is on the top middle. We actually used an experiment on a piece of equipment called Mobile PV, which gave real-time feedback on procedures for effectively just-in-time training. So you had a small LCD mounted on the wrist with a small camera that gave you direct feedback and to Mission Control where they actually talked you through a procedure and provided you with the type of feedback necessary to accomplish a task that maybe you weren't overly familiar with. What we're doing actually in that picture, one of the objectives was testing new water sampling techniques uh, for the quality of water that would be used later on in the space station. Down in the bottom right hand corner, you can see a modified mini mission control that was set up actually for this mission. You had multiple science teams, multiple NASA teams brought in. And one of the pictures of one of the interior objectives and tools that we use is called Playbook. Effectively, every five minute block of each day from the moment that you wake up to the moment that you go to sleep is effectively mapped out in real time. And you have a thin red line that you are continuously chasing. Once you get behind, that timeline turns red and you're effectively under stress, under operational stress to try and make up that time and do makeup tasks to try and get ahead of that timeline to make sure that you accomplish everything necessary during the day. One of the other tools that we tested during this mission was an EVA swab tool. On this mission we tested it internally, but this would be used later on to actually go and swab the outside of a vehicle to make sure there are no contaminants on the outside. Some of the exterior objectives for this mission centered around the testing of new optical communications equipment, actually looking at different arrays of different types of light for non-contact communication in the water. And then what we actually did was we used coral reef exploration and coral reef identification as an analog for actually looking at exobiology, exogeology, of actually going and identifying samples on another surface retrieving those samples, containing those samples, and processing those samples as if we were on the surface of another planet. So core reef exploration, and one of the things that we actually did, which had real world application, was we actually built the world's deepest underwater coral nursery. And one of the reasons that that is important is this type of environment gives us the opportunity to test new corals at different depths, which can then be applied, we can actually use to regrow coral reefs around the world and to actually help regrow dead coral reefs or coral that has died off. Coral is effectively the filtering system for the world's oceans. And the key component of being able to regrow this coral means that these missions have an application that have a much larger footprint on the Earth than just this single habitat of mission. The other component is actually testing new EVA tools um, for retrieving these samples, actually looking at what works, what doesn't. It's much easier to test these tools in an underwater environment like this with high fidelity and um, trained operators like the astronauts than it is trying to fly them in space um, and the time, money and expense that goes into that. So that's another very important component of what this mission brings to the table. So now looking at some of the medical research that has been done on this and other NEMO missions. Um, CASPER was the first Irish experiment that actually flew on the space shuttle and the International Space Station. 
It was developed off looking at a single lead ECG as a surrogate marker for sleep disruption and instability. Polysomnography is the gold standard, however the equipment necessary for monitoring sleep in a sleep lab is cumbersome, it's expensive um, and there's a lot of it. You cannot fly that in space. So looking at using a single accessible portable uh, method like a single EDCG, not looking so much at the stages of sleep, but looking at sleep instability, sleep disturbance. And uh, we flew this on the International Space Station in 2006, then it was used on NEMO, we sent it to the Arctic, we sent it to a Mars desert analog and actually collected about 250 nights worth of data demonstrating that this was an effective technique. And what it actually uses is a technique um, and an algorithm called cardiopulmonary coupling using high and low frequency coupling components from heart rate variability and or to or sinus rhythm and its changes, we can actually create a visual representation of these changes in sleep pattern of the astronauts. We know from historical records that the three biggest components of sleep disturbance for the astronauts is changes in noise, vibration, temperature. So looking at those components and then having a monitoring technique that not only measures the disturbance, but if you implement a countermeasure, artificial melatonin, changes in looks, the intensity of the light. Astronauts slow for an amazing amount of sleep disruption due to the high intensity mission, the changes in sunrise and sunset every 90 minutes, and the change in circadian rhythm. All of these factors play a role. So being able to create that visual representation and then being able to look at it, also having application to domestic sleep pathology, people that have sleep apnea, applying sleep CPAP, we can actually see that visual change in the sleep pattern when the countermeasure is actually employed using this type of technology. Telemedicine was also one of the other key components of this mission. We got to test a range of telemedicine equipment that's also been used in the conventional medical environment and um, using a remote portal where a flight surgeon or a physician could actually go and view the data from their patient, from their aquanaut, from their astronaut in real time securely and actually make medical decisions or have a face to face with their patient based on that at any one time. You can see read down here in the bottom left hand corner using a fluid monitor. That fluid monitor is currently used in conventional domestic medical practice for hydration monitoring, monitoring heart failure patients. Heart failure is the largest chronic patient population in the world, responsible for the largest number of unnecessary readmissions, the largest healthcare cost, and the largest number of fines in the American healthcare system. The number one reason for unnecessary readmissions in heart failure is fluid overload. Everybody's seen these patients. They have pulmonary congestion. They have pitting edema in the ankles. This monitor can actually detect changes in fluid status three to five days in advance of the clinical signs and symptoms of fluid overload. So being able to actually anticipate, provide a predictive index for this problem allows you to intervene before that patient ends up back in hospital. Employing it on this type of mission not only provides us with valuable data on the crew, dehydration, hydration, fluid status in this type of working environment, especially underwater, is a key component, but getting that feedback from operator crew members who can provide critical feedback on the use of the technology, how it's used, why it's used, how it could be better used, has direct feedback into improving that type of biotechnology in a conventional medical environment. The other component is looking at technologies that are possibly non-electro based and in this type of environment, long duration environments and even in conventional medical environments, the use of electrodes often causes dermatological issues. Investigating new technologies that will provide better data based on carbon based electrodes that are non-adhesive based provides valuable feedback and also gives us the opportunity to test these new technologies, troubleshoot them in an operational environment that would otherwise not be available. One of the key components of the life science research that's been done by NASA at the moment is looking at telomere research, changes in telomere length as a result of long duration spaceflight. This was especially apparent during the recent year-long mission um, conducted by Mark and Scott Kelly where you had one twin in orbit, the other here on Earth, both astronauts, 
and actually looking at the delta between their telomere length after this year-long mission. We did the same thing looking at telomere and epigenetics on the NEMO mission, providing us with the opportunity to actually establish a before, during and after baseline and the, the delta between the telomere length. We actually saw a degradation in the length of telomeres even with this short duration mission. One of the reasons that's important, it allows us now to employ a new technology using a Trojan horse liposome, encapsulating a DNA plasmid encoded for TERT, telomerase reverse transcriptase, which is the rate limiting protein within the human body that actually causes or stops re-elongation of these telomeres. Looking at a long-term healthcare mitigation strategy for astronauts going beyond Earth orbit, we can actually go and optimize their health, try and re-elongate their telomeres and ensure that the degradation that would occur over a three-year mission would say to Mars due to high cortisol levels, uh, long duration exposure to cosmic radiation, the possible long-term devastating sequelae that could occur as a result of that can now be mitigated against by new healthcare strategies looking at a cellular and looking at the telomere length and some components of epigenetics. So research that has been done in these type of analog missions not only have application to the space program but have pretty significant applications to a conventional medical um, population as well. Some of the other experiments that we did was P-STOP, looking at vestibular function testing, looking at small 3D sensors that would be attached to various parts of the body where we compare before, during and after the mission, looking at the change in the vestibular function due to exposure to this type of oxidative stress, high operational tempo mission environment, which is application for changes in vestibular function that patients with PTSD uh, may suffer from or other psychological disorders. Um, some of the other experiments that have been done in the past is telesurgery. There was an entire telesurgery unit set up within the Aquarius habitat where the surgeon was actually based hundreds of miles away in Duke University and actually conducted telesurgery under a three second delay. Again, looking at the application of this type of technology, not only for a spaceflight application, but looking at it even in a terrestrial domestic medical environment or a domestic surgical environment with this type of capability might be necessary. Being able to troubleshoot it and really look at the fidelity and finesse of this type of technology and being able to apply it not only for a mission-based environment, but for real application to patients and future surgical care. So medicine on the edge. Not only do we do medical research, but there are medical concerns of actually living and working in this type of environment. You're living effectively in a small space station down on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. You're in a mini analog environment, but you're in a saturation diving environment as well. What does that mean? It means that after 24 hours, the body's tissues, all of the body's tissues are completely saturated with nitrogen. Why is this a problem? It means that the enemy is now the surface. You can no longer go from the seafloor to the surface on a whim. One of the reasons that NEMO and the Aquarius Laboratory is such a good training environment is because the body understands, the human brain understands that you cannot just walk out the front door. If you're in a bunker, if you're in an inflatable habitat, if a contingency happens, if you have a medical emergency, something like that, you can walk out the front door. In Aquarius, if something happens, you must go through a 15 hour decompression on O2 to actually get back to the surface. The picture on the right hand side actually demonstrates the crew that are going through this 15 hour decompression on an O2 protocol during the day and night before they actually come back up to the surface. This has real risk with real medical implications in case something happens. It is an operational extreme environment. Those 15 hours are very important because it replicates the same time print that is required if you had to do an emergency evacuation from the International Space Station back down to the surface. The parallels that we see both on the physiological hormonal and metabolic components actually replicate very, very closely the same type of effects that we see on the human body during short duration space shuttle missions when they were being flown. In addition to the 15 hour decompression, the possibility for decompression sickness that could result 
as of a medical contingency in this type of environment. Some of the other components that we saw were trauma. Any kind of nick, any kind of cut, any type of trauma that would be involved in this type of environment would be exponentially increased in its level of significance due to living and working underwater in an undersea laboratory. Infection, dermatological infection as a result of small cuts due to the hot, humid, um, wet environment that we would encounter down there can become a much bigger problem very quickly. Within 24 hours, a small cut can become dramatically infected. And again, you cannot just evacuate somebody to the surface. The use of antibiotics, the use of um, sterile dressings and so on become compromised in an environment that is effectively designed for bacteria to grow. Another aspect is the psychosocial aspect. One of the reasons that we put crew members down into this environment is to look at team dynamics. How do people respond to living and working in this environment? Again, a small tin can on the sea floor. Some people, the claustrophobic aspect, the high intensity working environment, the operational component. You put all of those together and then you put a team of different personality types, often typed A-type personalities. Those that are designed and work to push themselves, that want to achieve, but people get tired, people can get irritated. So looking at all of those components and the psychological aspect of dealing with those is something that is studied and is looked out for and really needs to be understood in this type of environment to ensure that those team dynamics do not become a bigger issue and ensuring that future crew members, not only in Nemo, but going on long duration space flight and possibly beyond the Earth orbit on a multi-year mission, that these components of understanding the nuances and the psychological aspect of putting this type of crew together are really so well understood. And that's many of the reasons why this is such a valuable, high fidelity training iron log and why it's used not only for medical research, not only for understanding crew members, the psychological, the psychosocial aspect, but the training and testing environment that we use to get future crews ready uh, for long duration spaceflight.